So we are going to start a brand new series today called Family Function. Um, my wife and I, and for those in the married, uh, that are in the room that are married may be able to test this, or even dating, um, my wife and I, when we got married, we found out that we were different in a lot of different ways. Like there's a lot of ways that we were very different. Here's a couple examples. And a lot of this is because this is how my family was. My family was a certain way. Her family was a certain way. So when we came together, we brought our family of origins, our family mottos and what we did as a family to the marriage. Here's a couple of things that I did when I was a kid. Um, I had a TV in my room. So I used to watch TV because my parents were cooler than your parents if you didn't have a TV in your room. So I had a TV in my room. Erica never, she didn't have cable. So which is crazy to me. And, but I, so I would watch TV all, all night. So because of that, when we got married, I was used to having a TV in my room and she didn't want it. So now we um, compromise with me having a little laptop that she hates that I watch in order for me to fall asleep. So that's one thing that we do. Um, another difference that we found is at my house, when it came to the dishwasher, we wanted the dishwasher to do its job, to wash the dishes. So we would barely clean the dish. We would just stick in the dishwasher because what's, what's the point of a dishwasher if it's not going to wash it? Where Erica's family cleaned the dish before she put it in the dishwasher for some reason. So when we got married, we had to compromise. And the compromise was, I have to do it the way Erica told me to do it. That was our compromise. Um, Santa, in my, ha- my house, we never celebrated Santa. We didn't know anything about Santa. We knew of him. Um, uh, Topper, Eric Topper, I don't know if he's here today, but he comes here, some of you may know him. We ruined Santa for him because we were like, oh, we don't believe in Santa, you shouldn't either, it's not real. He's like, what? So um, where she did Santa, so we got married, we had to figure out, okay, are we going to do Santa? Are we not going to do Santa? How are we going to do it? And even just the holidays in general, we had to figure that out. Um, at Erica's house on Christmas, and Christmas is coming, um, some people started decorating already, and I'm telling you now, I'm going to judge you so hard. We don't judge you here, but I'm going to judge you if you set up now, okay? Give Thanksgiving its time. Um, that has nothing to do with what I'm talking about. So um, when it comes to holidays, when we go to Erica's parents on Christmas, we open the presents. It's a free-for-all opening the presents. Um, and then they nap. That's what Christmas is at her house. And my house, we all open one at a time. It takes about seven hours. It's New Year's Eve by the time we're done. And we are so loud. We play games. So we had to, we had to adjust. When I went to Erica's house, I was like, I'm bored. What are we going to do? And she's like, I'm taking a nap. When she comes to my house, she has to like, and re- figure out what she's going to do because it's going to be so loud at our house. There was a lot of things that were different. See, I had a family. She had a family. Then August 6, 2011, when we got married, those two families became one brand new family. And here's what a lot of people have trouble with, and here's what we had to adjust with. Before we got married, this was my priority, my family, my parents, my brother, my sister. That was my priority. And her priority was her family. The second you get married, your parents are not your priority anymore. Your family is not your priority because you have now created a brand new family. That is your priority. So now when we have to figure out what we're going to do with the kids on holidays, we don't figure out what's best for them. We figure out what's best for our priority because that's our priority, right? So when you, what, with family, it's, it gets hard because at times we are trying to function as a family, but you may attest to this, it feels like just dysfunction all the time. It was like, I'm taking them to soccer. We are taking them to church on Sunday mornings. We're figuring that out. I have to make lunches. We got to get them to school. We don't want to be late to school. All these different things. It feels a lot like dysfunction. But here's what's important. Here's what we're going to be learning about this entire series. The function of your family is the foundation from which your faith grows. The function of your family, whether it's good or bad, God is going to use the family that you are in to help your faith grow. And no matter what circumstance it is. I mean, when we think of God, the best way God described himself to us was how? God the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Family. That's how he described it. So the, whatever family is, whether it's a really good family or we've had a really bad family in our lifetime, from that foundation, we are, our faith is going to come out of that. So the question we're going to wrestle with here is, how can we have a family that functions the way God wants it to function? How can we do that? The entire series, we're going to be talking about kids. We're going to talk about the family that you don't necessarily like, that you're going to have to see on Thanksgiving, that weird uncle, that crazy aunt that you've got to figure out, how do we deal with this family? And then we're going to talk about the church family as a whole. But today, we're going to talk about the most important part of your family, and that's the marriage. Some of you in this room aren't married, but you want to be married one day. The marriage is the priority. And here's what we need to understand. The health of your marriage determines the health of your family. The health of your marriage, it it goes to every other aspect. How healthy your family life will be when it comes to your kids is going to be determined by how healthy your your marriage is. 
And for those of you in the room that have gone through a toxic relationship or you have been divorced before, you know this better than I do, right? You would say, yeah, it's true because I'm still, we're still suffering the effects of what that marriage was, of what that relationship was with our kids. We're still having to deal with that. The health of your marriage determines the health of your family. So if that's true, we should talk about marriage or your future marriage. So we're going to be talking in one verse today. There's a lot of passages I could have used to talk about today. There's Ephesians 5, which we, we talked about before, which talks about submitting to each other. There's 1 Corinthians 13, which um, you may have had read at your, at your wedding, or you've been to a wedding that has had that. It's all the loved one. But this verse is a verse that my wife and I have really been um, just wrestling with this week. It's one verse that isn't even geared towards marriage, but if we apply it to marriage or to any relationships that you have, if you're here and you're, and you're single, any relationships that you have, it can change everything if we start to apply it. And here's what it is, Ephesians chapter 4, verse 32. It says this, Instead, be kind to each other, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, just as God, through Christ, has forgiven you. Can we all say that with... I know I used to be a youth pastor. We used to make this people do this all the time. But I want to make you guys do it. Okay, I'm the lead pastor now. So we're going to say this together. You ready on the count of three? One, two, three. Be kind to each other, tenderhearted, Okay, don't do it with energy, guys. Just, just read it because I'm making you, okay? This verse is so important. And it's so, we can get so much out of this verse. Be kind to each other, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, just as God, through Christ, has forgiven you. What does this verse say? It says three things. And if you want to take notes, um, you can take notes on these. Here's the three things that it tells us. One, if we want a marriage that functions, we need kindness. Number one, kindness. Be kind to each other. You need to be kind. Um, kindness is hard to explain at times, but you know it. Like, you know when someone's being kind to you and someone's not being kind to you. Like, no matter what, you know it, but it's hard to explain. A lot of times we think kindness is nice. If you're nice, then that's what kindness is. But kindness is way more than being nice. Here's what kindness is. It's being positive, affirming, and generous. And in the ta- what we're talking about in marriage is positive, affirming, and generous to your spouse and about your spouse. There's that part. So even when your spouse is not around, you're still kind and generous to them when you talk to your friends, when you talk to your boys, when you talk to your girlfriends, whatever it is. Treating each other in this, with the same gentleness, courtesy, compassion, and respect that you want people to treat you with, that is what kindness is. And here's a story that happened to me this week that always seems to happen when we're talking about marriage. Um, I was going to talk to you guys about marriage and show you some great examples. Then we showed a great example this, this week of not kindness. So here's what happened. I'm uh, getting the kids ready. My wife always leaves for work before I do. Um, I only work on Sundays, so I'm off the whole week. It's a joke, everybody. Calm down. Um, So I was taking care of the kids. I was getting the lunches ready, and all of a sudden I got a call from my wife, and she just left five minutes ago, so I knew it wasn't a good call. It's like, oh, gosh, what happened? So I answered, and um, she went, uh, I I got a flat tire. I went, okay. So I get all the kids in the car. We drive over to where she is. She luckily wasn't very far at all. And we get there, and I had just woken up. I was a little grumpy. And we get out there, and this tire, I have never seen a tire so flat in my life. It's like if I had a knife and tried to dig a hole out of the tire, it wouldn't have been as flat as this tire was. So I said, what in the world happened to this tire? She said, well, I was trying to get out of the way of this bus, and I ran into the curb, and the curb must have had spikes on it or something, and popped the whole thing. (laughs) So like, okay. So... um, I'm like, all right, I'll start fixing it. And my wife, bless her heart, is trying to help by asking me, what can I do to help? And in my head, the answer was, not ask me what, I, what you can do for help. I just need you away so I can do this. Again, I woke up. I was grumpy. Okay, I'm a sinner just like all of us, okay? So I was trying to change this tire, and um, I, I was having trouble getting, getting some of the lug nuts off. It was really tight, and I'm trying to do it. And she, Erica's like, well, what if you try it this way? I'm like, I get it. I know how to do it. And it ended with, Erica, I need you to leave me alone so I can change this tire. She stormed back to the car, took the kids back home to get ready for school, and then she drove back, and when she came back, we were just as grumpy. She would ask, hey, where's the spare? I said, I already put the spare back, Erica. I already took care of it. Like, I'm talking just like that. And the conversation ended with her getting in the car, me getting in the other car, and driving off. So I, we both showed, especially me, showed a lack of kindness. It was resolved hours later when she texted me first, saying sorry, shows the kind of guy I am. I had to wait for her to text me. So that, I, yeah, I'm not, I'm not always a great example, right? Kindness. 
Kindness, we didn't show kindness. Kindness is so important. Here's what Proverbs 3 verse 3 says, never let loyalty and kindness leave you. Tie them around your neck as a reminder, write them deep within your heart. Now, I know with some of you unmarried people that maybe you have a boyfriend or girlfriend or maybe you don't, you're just single. I know what you're thinking right now. The message really is that you need to be kind to your spouse. Like this is the revolutionary thing you're going to teach us to be kind. Now, here's what I want to say to you guys, guys and girls. When you are dating somebody and they're not kind to you, you know what you do? You break up with him. So don't judge us married people that have trouble showing kindness to our spouses, okay? We live with them every day. We're around them all the time, right? But for us that are married, man, kindness, it is hard to be kind at all times, isn't it? See, so the question I want to ask you is, when it comes to your spouse or your fiance or your boyfriend or girlfriend, whatever relationship you want to apply this to, are you kind to them? Are you kind when you talk to them? Is it kind or is it not kind? Are you kind when you talk to your friends about them? Or when you talk and hang out with your other friends, do you treat them in a way that you don't treat your own spouse? Like, do you treat your spouse like dirt and you treat your friends like they're the best thing ever? Like, you would think you would do to your, your spouse, you would never do to your friends. Do you do that? Because we're called to be kind. Now, I know it's easy to say, hey, be kind. It's an action that we're supposed to do. Um, and you can start applying this. You can start going, hey, I'm going to be kind this week. I'm, gonna, I'm kind. I'll say nice things. But it's hard to start to change your heart, right? Because that's where it comes from. So we have to do number two, like the verse says. We have to have a tender heart. If we want to have a family that functions and we want to show kindness, it comes from the heart. We have to have a tender heart. I'm going to say, what in the world does that mean? Having a tender heart means that you easily move towards kindness to somebody. It's easy for you to do it. You easily move to love to compassion, and to kindness. See, compassion, when they mess up, showing that, that's having a tender heart. Helping them feel love when they feel lonely, that's having a tender heart. Showing kindness no matter what is happening in life, no matter how stressed you are at work, no matter what has happened that day, that is kindness. See, the original word for tender heart here is only found one other time in Scripture, and it's also Peter who who says this in 1 Peter 3, verse 8 through 9. Here's what it says, the only other time this is written in Scripture. All of you have unity of mind, sympathy, brotherly love, a tender heart, and a humble mind. Do not repay evil for evil or, or reviling for reviling, but on the contrary, bless, for this is who you are called, that you may obtain a blessing. When you have a tender heart, the result will be kindness. You will show kindness to your relationships when your heart is tender. But the issue with most struggling marriages, struggling marriages or marriages that are getting close to divorce, here's the number one issue that every book that I've read has said, all the research I've done, I've, I've done training for premarital counseling, all, they all say the same thing. The number one issue with struggling marriages, we normally think it's a finance issue, like finances are an issue, or, or it's fidelity, it's nothing, none of those. The number one issue for struggling marriages is contempt. Contempt is not caring anymore. Say, well, I just don't care. That's the number one issue in all struggling marriages and all marriages that get divorced or are about to get divorced. The number one issue that's in almost all of them is a lack of caring. It says, I I just don't care about it anymore. And that's the opposite of having a tender heart. It's having a hard heart that says, you know what? I'm done caring. I'm sick of this fight. I'm sick of doing this all the time. So I'm done. Contempt. See, what you do when your relationship is full of contempt, what do you do when you have that? How do, you, how do you transfer to a tender heart? And here's um, what the Gottman Institute says about having contempt and how to fix that. Here's a quote that I thought was great. It says, relationships die by ice rather than fire. Some couples eventually stop trying to dialogue. They find working on key conflicts to be too difficult or painful. They give up. They grow more distant and live more like roommates than spouses. In the end, emotional disengagement is truly the ultimate sign of a relationship heading towards divorce. If you're both still arguing, you haven't reached the point of surrender. Contempt, having a hard heart. But how do we have a tender heart? Because here's what the research says. says 69% of problems in all of our marriages are problems that are going to continue. They are problems. They are perpetual. They are ongoing. We're only 31% are easy solutions. You can take care of it. It's over. 69% of the problems that we have in our marriages, we're going to have to keep dealing with. What does that mean? These are not going to go away. That means we have to keep fighting to work on it. So how do we come to a point where we have a tender heart so that we can show kindness instead of having a hard heart? How do we do that? 
Well, the verse says it, and number three, the number three important thing we need is forgiveness. Forgiveness. Here's what forgiveness means. Forgiveness means letting them off the hook for something they did wrong. Forgiveness means giving them the benefit of the doubt. Forgiveness means assuming the best in them. Forgiveness means dropping it. Whenever that conflict comes, you drop it. So I have a little illustration I actually wanted to show you guys, and I, I already got a couple that's going to help me with this. Um, Brittany, can you come on up? Let's give Brittany a round of applause. <laughs> illustration I wanted to show you guys really quick. Let me bring this over here. So you guys can come right over here. So this is an illustration that I learned that I found from somebody else on YouTube. So um, I'm basically stealing this illustration, okay? But I'm, I give him credit, okay? So um, here's, yeah, you can stand right there. You're good. So here's what, here's our illustration. You guys have been married for how long? Too long. <laughs> So, okay, two years, two years. Nate, you're going to need to really learn this illustration today, okay? So, let's say that this represents a little wood thing right here. This represents your guy's love in a marriage, your guy's relationship. And here's what happens in marriages, and you know this, and we all know this, is that um, a lot of times we will give each other an offense. We will do something wrong. So, I think it's a little piece here. A lot of times we will give someone an offense. Here, Nate, hold this for a second, and Brent, why don't you stand right here? So sometimes, here's what happens in, in a marriage, is that, um, especially, I'll talk to the guys, this is a stereotype I know, but it's true for most of us, is that we say dumb things, or there's something that we are supposed to say or supposed to do, and we don't do it. And a lot of times, what that produces is an offense, an offense to Brit or offense to your spouse. So let's say, let's give an example here, let's say that um, Brit was working hard all day and you were off that day. And she was working late, and she was excited to get home and hoping that dinner would be served and there would be dinner ready. But Britt normally does all the cooking. She's a lot better cook than Nate. Is that true? Yeah. Okay, cool. So, but she's like, you know what? I worked really hard. It's 8 o'clock. I'm just hoping I go show up that dinner's ready and we're good to go. But Nate didn't think about dinner ever. When she comes home, he goes, hey, so what are we doing for dinner? And Britt's like, well, I thought you'd have dinner. It's like, well, we can go to Chipotle or something. Like, it's like, I don't want to go to Chipotle. I want it to be ready. That's an offense. So let's pass this offense to Britt. Now, Britt has this offense that she has to decide what she's going to do with it. Nate did something dumb. Britt's got to figure out what to do with it. Or the opposite is true. The opposite is true. Sometimes, um, let's, let's think of another example here. Let's say um, you guys are trying to work on your finances. You guys are trying to have a better budget, right? And you guys are working hard, and you're really figuring out the budget. And Britt says, I'm going to go do an errand really quick. And this is more Eric and I's example here. Um, I'm going to go do an errand really quick. And she goes to the store that all of us guys hate to hear, Target. And all of a sudden, that one or two things, she comes back with bags and bags and bags of stuff from Target. And in your head, you're like, well, we're trying to keep a budget. I'm trying to make sure I'm not spending, but I'll just get errand. And then you would say something like, well, here's the thing, Nate. The, the reason why I got all this stuff is because it was on sale. <laughs> so here's what sometimes we do. You guys come this way. Sometimes here's what we do with this offense we've been given. We take this offense and we put it right here. You think, man, she doesn't really care about me. She doesn't care about our budget. She's not even worried about it. Here's an offense. But Britt, you're still a little, a little upset about the dinner thing that happened. It's like, you want to go to Chipotle again. You don't even like Chipotle all that much. And here we go. <laughs> so it happens. It's just one offense. Or here's what happens a lot of times too, is sometimes the thing that you love about your spouse when you're dating turns out to be the thing that drives you the most nuts when you're actually married, right? Like maybe, I'm just making up an example here, maybe Britt was really quiet when you guys first got married and mysterious and you like that about her. Now you got married, she's like, she won't ever talk and she won't ever tell me anything that she's feeling. Just a little offense. Or maybe Britt, maybe you love that Nate was the life of the party at all times and so talkative and now that you're married, he just won't ever shut up. <laughs> shut up. Am I just too accurate? Shut up, Nate, is what she thinks. It's just one little offense. Or um, let's give a personal illustration here. Sometimes um, Erica can't really relax when, um, when the house is a little messy. When you put the kids to bed, if there's stuff there, she can't really relax. I can relax in anything. It doesn't matter to me. So sometimes when the day's over and we put the kids to bed and I'm exhausted, the last thing I feel like doing is picking up all the stuff that they're about to get all out in seven hours when they wake up. So I just decide to sit there and watch TV where Erica cannot relax and she starts cleaning up. So sometimes she's like, why doesn't he care about me? Why doesn't he do anything about this stuff? He knows that I like when it's cleaned up. And I'm thinking, why do I now have to clean everything up? Because you decide I have to clean up right now when I'm really tired. It's just an offense. Here's what happens, Britt, come here. 
Stay right there. Here's what happens in our marriage. This one little offense creates a wall. And now just one little thing that turns out to be something, and then we're back here going, Nate, we haven't been to Chipotle in like a year. Why don't we go to Chipotle? Just one little thing. And here's what happens. The person you imprison is not them. It's you. You imprison yourself, and you block yourself off. Now this marriage that's supposed to be a unity, that's supposed to be a team, is now separated by offense. But if only we could find an example, if only we can find one example in the history of our world or in, in Scripture where somebody had every right to hold something against you, but they decided not to. If only there's one example we can think of. So here's what we do. Brittany, come on over here. This is going to be revolutionary to some of you guys. When we have this offense that we are given, here's what we do. You ready? You guys ready? Taking notes on this? <laughs> Drop it. That's called forgiveness. He gives you, she gives you that offense where she spends all that money and you're like, what in the world? You can either put it there or you can <laughs> drop it. Maybe they didn't clean the house like you wanted them to um, and you're a little upset about that. You can hold on to that or you can <laughs> drop it. You can take it and you can hold on to that and really be, bur- you have, have hold this, on this burden and really be struggling with this or you can <laughs> drop it. Those are our options. We can take it and build a fence, or we can forgive, assume the best, and drop it. You guys have a seat. Give it up for Nathan and Britt. Here's what's important. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 32. Be kind to each other, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, just as God, through Christ, has forgiven you. We have seen the example of forgiveness in our lives. If we want to be kind to each other, we have to have a tender heart. If you want to have a tender heart, it starts with forgiveness. Forgiveness is not about them. It's about you. Because when you don't forgive, you put yourself in your own prison. You keep yourself trapped. We think, oh, we're going to forgive because it's better for them. No, you need to forgive for you. You're going to be trapped up in the chains of whatever it is. You can keep taking, it's just, it's just one little fence. It's just one time they overspent. It's just this one thing. I'm just going to harbor onto this. You can do that, or you can say, you know what? I'm going to assume the best in my relationships, and I'm going to forgive. Because when I make myself forgive, even when I don't want to drop it, and I know, and I want to hold it against them, when we do that, it starts to create a tender heart inside of us. And we have a tender heart. We will easily move towards kindness. Be kind to each other tenderhearted, forgiving one another, just as God through Christ has forgiven you. Can we pray? Dear God, you are the God that shows us the best example of forgiveness. That when we were sinners, we were separated from you, and we have done things that we shouldn't have done, and we have turned our back on you, that no matter what, you still forgave us. You sent your son to pay our penalty on a cross so we can be forgiven. And then three days later, you proved that he was and we said he was by raising him to life. I thank you for giving us that great example. God, I pray for the relationships that are in this room right now. The relationships that have built a fence between each other. That every time that little offense comes, instead of dropping it, we have built this fence. And dear God, I pray that today... You perform a miracle in marriages and in relationships. That you convict both sides to start dropping it. To show forgiveness. So that we can have a tender heart. And we can be kind to each other. God, I pray that you help us follow your example of forgiveness. In our marriages. In our friendships. With our kids be quick to forgive, and even when we don't want to forgive, I pray that you give us the energy and the motivation, the conviction to forgive. Create a tender heart in us. God, thank you for showing us the model of love, for giving us a hope. 
I pray that as we leave here today and we sing this last song, that we glorify you in our marriage.